Praise the Lord. We may stand in as we pray together. Father, we thank you for tonight. We bless your name for bringing your workers together. And we're asking, O oh Lord, that you open our eyes to behold great and wonderful things in your word tonight in Jesus' name. Speak to every heart. We're looking up to you that your will will be done and your word will be obeyed in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a good amen. amen. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. And I read from verse 29 all through to verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that ye may minister grace to the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Let's come back to verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. As you look at that verse, there's one word that comes out that we need to understand. The word sealed. It says, whereby ye believers... Ye Christians, ye saints, ye righteous ones are sealed. And then it says, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's a picture of a person that has a precious property, an important property. And he is traveling out of town. While in town, before he travels out, he seals his property and he puts his stamp on it and his stamps or his name on that seal on the wax and he's so secured and he keeps it safe then he travels out and he's coming back and the day of return is the day of recovery the day of redemption the day when he takes his property back. To take that property back, he'll look at the property. He'll see the seal of approval of ownership on that property. Then he will take it to himself. The Lord is telling us hereby, the apostles through the Spirit. It says, we children of God, we are his inheritance. We are the property of the Lord. Don't you know that you are purchased of the Lord? We are precious and peculiar. He's gone up to heaven, to the far country. He puts his seal, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit on us. When you get saved, it's the Holy Spirit that bears witness. When you are sanctified, it's the Holy Spirit that bears witness. When you are baptized with the Holy Ghost, you are filled and immersed with the Holy Ghost. In fact, we are told in Romans chapter 8 verse 9, He that has not the Spirit of God is not his. And so, if we belong to God, we have the seal upon the purchased possession. And the seal remains there. But the seal is not something inanimate. It's a living seal. That's the Holy Ghost. He can be grieved. 
You can't grieve a chair. You cannot grieve a bench. You cannot grieve, grieve a tree. You only grieve a living personality. And it says the seal we have, the stamp we have, is the living spirit, the Holy Spirit. And it says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you believers are sealed unto the day of redemption, unto the day of Christ's return, when you will redeem his soul and take his soul to heaven. And it's so very important that you understand this verse. That's why we're looking at the word tonight, keeping the spirit seal by not grieving him. Keeping the spirit seal by not grieving him. The Holy Spirit is a seal. On the true believer, he is a comforter. While he remains there upon us, he comforts us. Number two, he is our guide. He guides our feet into the way of heaven so that our destiny, our destination can be heaven. And the apostle is saying by the Spirit, he is your guide and he's your friend. He is guiding you. And is close by your side. Grieve not your guide so that it doesn't abandon you. Number three, he is our teacher. He says he's teaching us how to profit with the word. He's teaching us how to prosper in the way of righteousness. Don't grieve your teacher lest he stops teaching you. He is our intercessor. And he's saying, grieve not the intercessor. In your times of weakness, in your time of powerlessness, he is the one that is praying for you, interceding for you like no man can. Grieve not your intercessor. He is our strengthener. He is the one that strengthens us. He shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. He strengthens us in weakness, in our times of trial, in times of pressure, in times at crossroads, is the one that comes to strengthen us. Do not grieve your strength now. Otherwise, if he leaves you alone, you are vulnerable and you are easily defeated. Is a power, the power of God in man. If we're going to remain powerful, bold, and courageous, we need a partnership. Grieve not the Holy Spirit who is given to you for power. Number seven is the gift for ministry. The gift for ministry. All those manifestations we read about in First Corinthians chapter 12 will not happen without the presence and the prominence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Grieve not the Spirit of God who manifests the gifts in your life he is the seal. The seal when you find, for example, the dog of a king and the collar, special collar and seal, index indication that this belongs to the king. Everybody is careful. You cannot touch that animal because of the seal. The same thing it says, we are God's property. And the Lord has put his seal upon us and he says, grip not the spirit of God. That is a seal. So that when the devil sees you, you will see that seal. When evil people see you, they will see that seal. And because they see that seal upon you, that's why they will not touch you. That's why they cannot harm you. Come back now to Bastachi and see how you understand. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day. You are sealed now, and the seal remains upon your life unto the day 
of redemption. Let all bitterness, that's going to tell us the things that grieve the Holy Spirit. When you are much younger, perhaps you lived in the village and you wanted to catch an animal that resides inside the hole of a hill. And what can you do? You cannot dig that hole and get into that hole to catch the animal. So what you will do is to look at the openings of the hole. And you set fire here, and you do not allow the smoke to come out. You drive the smoke into the path of the hole. As the animal inside the hole will feel the discomfort of the smoke, then it will try to come out. Try to come out on this side, he sees the fire. And so he knows there's another opening on the other end. And he tries to come out from the other hole. Meanwhile, there are people waiting, boys like you waiting on this other side. As the animal is running away from the smoke, then you kill the animal. He's telling us that the things that is recorded in verse 31, they're like smoke in the nostrils of the spirit. And when you allow this smoke to come into your life, instead of him, the living seal, remaining there, you will get out because of the smoke. What constitutes the smoke? Let all bitterness, bitterness in the heart. That's the smoke. Rust in your life. That's the smoke. Anger. That's the smoke. Clamor. Not only that you have rust or you have anger, it gets hold of you and it takes the better part of you. You're shouting, you're screaming, and you're bullying on the people. That's the clamor. And evil speaking that some people indulge in. He said, put them away with all malice. He says, those are the things that will constitute discomfort and grief and sorrow to the mind of the spirit. And because of that smoke and because of all those traits and tendencies, he departs. He says, on the other hand, you make sure that in your life, in verse 32, be kind one to another. The Holy Spirit lives in the atmosphere of kindness, of tenderness, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. He lives in the atmosphere of forgiveness and mercy and compassion and love. Then it says, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's what the Lord is teaching us tonight. To grieve him is to make him withdraw and to leave us to ourselves. When anyone grieves the Spirit and the Spirit abandons him, it becomes empty. It becomes shallow. He is left to himself. It becomes natural. When the power departed from, from Samson, he became like every other man, natural. When the spirit leaves, the person becomes carnal. He becomes nominal. He becomes powerless. He becomes vulnerable. That's why tonight we're looking at the message, keeping the spirit sealed by not grieving him. Three things we're looking at. Number one, recognizing the tendency of grieving our holy God. God can be grieved. Christ can be grieved. The Holy Ghost can be grieved. The Godhead can be grieved. Recognizing the tendency of grieving our holy God. Point number two, 
renouncing the transgressions that grieve our heavenly guide, renouncing the transgressions, the sins, the bad habits, our bad tendencies that grieve our heavenly guide, renouncing the transgressions that grieve our heavenly guide. Point number three, retaining the tenderness while no more grieving the Holy Ghost. Now we understand we need tenderness in our lives, retaining the tenderness while no more grieving the Holy Ghost. Point number one, recognizing the tendency of grieving our holy God. God can be grieved. And when God is grieved, he doesn't stay there where he's being grieved habitually, deliberately, intentionally. We know the things that grieve him. While we persist in those things, the Lord will not remain there. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him, grieved him as a person. It can be grieved. It can be sorrowful. It can be sad. And it grieved him in his, at his heart. And so, when people are wicked, when people are corrupt, when people are evil, that grieves a holy God. Psalm 78. Reading from verse 40. Psalm 78, verse 40. How odd did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Those children of Israel, they were saved. They were brought out of captivity. And the word of God here says, very often they provoked him. And very often, they greet the God who is holy of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. Yea, verse 41, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. He had saved them in a way he had sealed them that none of the heathen nations they passed through could touch them. But they broke the seal. They greeted the Lord until the Lord made a pronouncement in Psalm 95 verse 10. Psalm 95, verse 10, 40 years long, was I grieved with this generation. It was grieved because habitually, because deliberately, because intentionally, they did things that were not in line with the will of God who had called them and delivered them out of captivity and was leading them to the land of promise. 
40 years long was I great with this generation and said it is the people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways for 40 years they couldn't know the ways of the Lord always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth of whom I swear unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest that's the consequence that's the result when he grieved him he said what he had promised them a place and habitation in the land of promise he withdrew the promise because they grieved him without having the mind to repent Hebrews chapter 3 verse 10 Hebrews chapter 3 verse 10 wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said did you always err in their heart always go astray in their heart always displease me in their heart always seen in their lives look at your life since you have claimed to be saved since you claimed to be born again have you always been sinning always been offending always been grieving the lord always getting into transgressions that god will say what is the evidence of the salvation that will proclaim wherefore i was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart they have not known my ways can we trust you to have known the ways of the lord can you take decision based on the ways of the lord can you say i know him is a holy god is a righteous god is a pure eyes that to behold iniquity this cannot be the way of the Lord. Can we trust you with that? For this people it says, they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. Tells us in verse 17, but with whom was he grieved those 40 years? And God is still the same. Whatever grieved him those 40 years, like murmuring, like grumbling, like complaining, they still give God today. God is ever the same. Murmuring grieves the Lord. Complaining grieves the Lord. Grumbling grieves the Lord. And fighting against the way of the Lord grieves the Lord but with whom was he grieved 40 years was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest but unto them that believe not so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief grieves the Lord. For Samuel, chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 11. For Samuel, chapter 15, verse 11. It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Saul had been chosen and selected and crowned 
to be king in Israel. And the Lord had sent him out to do something close to the heart of the Almighty God. He went, he did part, and he left part undone. And now God says he was going to reject him because it grieved God and grieved Samuel, his servant. You understand? Whatever grieves the father, grieves the son. Whatever grieves God, grieves the godly. What has, whatever grieves the almighty God, will grieve Samuel, whom he had appointed to choose Saul. Verse 12, And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Saul, saying, it was so Samuel, saying, Saul came to Camel, and behold, he set him up a place, and is gone about, and passed on, and gone unto Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Behold, be, be blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Look at that. He had not done everything he ought to do. And he came out bold-faced. And he said, Welcome. Behold, I have done and performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears? and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. He had not performed the will of the Lord. And there are people like that. They're loud in their testimony. They're loud in their proclamation. But deliberately, they have left and done what the Lord assigned them to do. And yet they will not own up. They will not agree. The seen Samuel, or the prophet of God, is blind, is deaf, and cannot hear the bleating of the sheep, and cannot see the evidence of partial obedience, partial disobedience. Eventually, Saul said, verse 20, Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed. He knew that. He knew the mind of God. The things which should have been utterly destroyed. He knew what God wanted. The chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. But they did it for a purpose to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight, in, in, in bond offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hacking than the fat of rams for rebellion. It's at the scene of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou was rejected the voice, the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. I feared the people. The fear of man 
in a worker, the fear of man. In a minister, the fear of man. In any servant of God, grieves the Lord. And so in your life, when it says, grieve not the Spirit of God. You check up your life. You know the commandments of God. You know the word of the Lord. If you are not totally and fully obeying, it will mean because you fear man more than God. And that grieves the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 36. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, reading from verse 16. In verse 16, but they mocked the messengers of God. They mocked the messengers of God. And they despised his words. And they misused his prophets. Until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people. Till there was no remedy. The Lord is grieved when his messengers are mocked. The Lord is grieved when his words are despised. The Lord is grieved when his prophets, proclaimers of the gospel, when they are misused. And then the anger of the Lord, the judgment of the Lord will arise until there is no remedy. Isaiah chapter 63 verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 63, verses 9 and 10. In all the affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old talking about the almighty God having compassion upon the people of Israel but look at what they did but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit they rebelled and dishonored his Holy Spirit therefore he was torn to be their enemy and he fought against them. He fought against them. As you come to the New Testament, they had not changed at all. Acts chapter 7, reading from verse 51. Acts chapter 7. Verse 51, ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. As they did in the Old Testament, that's what they still continue to do after Christ had died for their sins on the cross of Calvary. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept them. They kept on grieving the Spirit of God. Apart from those Jews that were Gentiles that also received the watch of the Lord and eventually because of their hardened callous hearts, because of their habitual carnal attitude, and because of their heartless, corrupt nature, they kept on grieving the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, 
verse 28. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy and went to hell under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorrow punishment suppose she shall ye be thought worthy who have trodden on the foot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified? The people who were saved, they backslid. They were sanctified, they backslid. And now they have counted the blood that saved them and sanctified them an unholy thing, no regard for the blood of the Lamb. And they have done despite unto the Spirit of grace, the Spirit of God that brought grace into their lives, they despised. It says, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The hardened, callous man grieves the Lord. He's not even aware. The habitually carnal man grieves the Lord and is unconcerned. The heartless, corrupt man grieves the Lord and he does not care. You cannot even see the anger of the Lord. The hell bent, hell bowed his chariot, grieved the Lord, and he was not moved with all the Lord's sorrow, all the Lord's warning. If the spirit departs, the end is grave and gloomy. When the Lord departs, and it says, bye-bye, you persisted in your evil, and then I leave you to yourself. The end will be terrible. Matthew chapter 23, reading from verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how thou Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. The Lord would have saved them, converted them, and their names could have been written in heaven. But they would not. The starting gate, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He left them, left them desolate. And their city became totally destroyed 70 AD. And millions of them went into captivity again, scattered all over. The world, many of them, millions of them died and they went to a lost eternity. Point number two now, what's the Lord demanding of us? Demanding of you, demanding of me, demanding of us, demanding of his church that will renounce the tendencies, the temperament, the transgressions that grieve our heavenly guide. Point number two, renouncing the transgressions that grieve our heavenly guide. We're coming back to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 and 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, verse 31. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Remember once again, we're God's property. 
were Christ's peculiar jewel, and he has put the seal upon us, the Holy Ghost, and is gone to heaven to prepare a place for us. Is coming again. The day of his coming for us is the day of a full redemption. We have redemption now, the forgiveness of our sin. We're going to have the final irreversible redemption on that day when he comes back. And the Holy Spirit is given as a seal to seal us up, the purchased possession, so that we are identified as belonging to him until that day of return, the day of redemption. What are the things we are to renounce? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Those are the things that grieve him. Number one, bitterness. We're looking at Psalm 64. Psalm 64. I'm reading from verse 3. Psalm 64, verse 3. Who wet their tongues, their tongue like a sword, and they bent bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. There are people that are bitter in their families, husbands to wives, wives to husbands, parents to children, and children, they will say, damn the consequence. Tell of the man, they're talking about their father. Tell of the old lady, they're talking about their mother. And they utter bitter words. And there are pastors that utter bitter words, angry words against members of the church. It grieves the spirit. There are members, on the other hand, that speak more often behind. And sometimes, those who are quite bold, and those who are callous, and those who say, do what you will. And there are members that can speak bitter words to their pastors. It says, they wet their tongues like a sword. And they bend their bows and shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. And suddenly, do they shoot at him and fear not. The people who pride themselves in the fact that I don't fear anybody. Even the pastor, he knows I don't fear him. Even the leaders, they know I don't fear them. I can say what I want to say. Do you know Carlos, church member, Carlos, church worker, backsliding church worker, that grieves the Lord, that grieves the heavenly guide. And when he is grieved, he goes away from you. And he leaves your life desolate. Look at verse 5. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying us near privily. They say, who shall see them? They say, who shall see them? Well, the Lord sees it tells us in Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 3, verse 14. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Some of them are churchgoers. Whose, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. The feet are sweet to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. When somebody has salvation, he has Christ, the Prince of Peace, abiding inside him. When somebody does not have salvation, he doesn't have the Prince of Peace living on the inside. He's not a man of peace. He's not a woman of peace. He's not a member for peace. Is there for conflict, for confrontation, 
the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Those who grieve the Holy Ghost by bitterness, they are guilty before the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 31, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath, all from surprise, let each be put away from you. All wrath, Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. But now ye also put off all these. Why? They grieve the Holy Ghost. Why? They grieve our heavenly guide. And he follows us everywhere. The seal is upon the purchased property everywhere. When you're in the room all alone, he knows, he sees. When you are outside, he knows, he sees. When you are having the fume and the smoke inside your heart, he knows. So now, he also put up all this anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Lie not one to another. Every kind of lie does evil. And so it grieves the Lord. There are some people who say there are white lies. I told him that white lie for this reason and for this reason. But you know, the white lie will deceive him. The person you are telling the white lie. He wants to go here, and instead of telling him not to go, and telling the very reason why he should not go, you tell him what you call a white lie. And he will have to make the conclusion by himself, out of that white lie, maybe I shouldn't go there. Maybe I shouldn't do that thing. He may take a wrong decision, but it's on the basis of your white lie. There's some people that tell us that their lying is professional. I don't know about professional lies, but you see some people say that's what we're trained for. We're trained to use lie and to use it professionally. And there are people in these days of the social media, there are people that will tell media lies. And the lie will deceive millions of people. And of those millions of people, some of them will backbite, some of them will grumble, some of them will write back and write evil things. All the media lies, they grieve the Spirit of God. There should be no form of lying. Lying comes from the devil, comes from Satan. And if you indulge in any lie, you are a ready slave in the hands of Satan. Verse 9, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Those things, wrath makes the Lord to be grieved in first Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. For some, there's a big favorite chapter. But maybe the only verses they know in this chapter, and they're ready to quote it all the time, is verse 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, not with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold and pearls or costly array. That's right, that's right. But just go one verse before that. One verse before that in verse 8. I will therefore 
that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, wrath against your wife, without wrath, wrath against your house fellowship member, without wrath, wrath against your boss in your place of work, without wrath, wrath against the community. You'll not be in a private place having a controversial kind of meeting, organization, how you will scatter your community that you lift up holy hands without wrath, wrath against your church. You know the church is contributing something to your life. That's why you are coming. You shouldn't have wrath against your church. Lifting up holy hands without wrath, wrath against your pastor. Why are you angry against your pastor? Has he preached false doctrine? Not really. But we expected him to spend 40 minutes his message. He took one hour. That's why you're unhappy. He's trying to explain, expound, interpret, apply the way to heaven. After 40 minutes, he wasn't sure you got it. And he said you must get it. That's why he took more time so as to lead you in the way that leads to heaven. You want to throw the pilot outside uh, the plane because you're not happy with, you know, the announcement is making, tighten your belt. Because he said tighten your belt, you said that before, and he said that again. That's why we have wrath against him. Bundle him up. Throw him outside the plane. Well, all the passengers there will be in danger. There should be no wrath against your pilot. No wrath against your, against your pastor. It says, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Wrath against anyone makes the Lord and our guide to be grieved. Come back to Ephesians Chapter 4, verse 31. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away. Anger to be put away. Didn't Christ say it very clearly in Matthew chapter 5? Matthew chapter 5, I read from verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother you understand with his sister you understand with her husband you understand with his wife you understand with his pastor you understand with his member whosoever is angry without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, that he is empty-headed fellow, shall be in danger of the council. There are people, they might say it quietly, they might look at the person and belittle him, they might look at her and belittle her, and in their heart they say, if she only knew how foolish she is, and the fellow looks at you and he says, Are you despising me? If you are not despised, who else will be despised? Are you saying I'm a fool? Well, you say it. You know that you're a fool. But you know what Jesus said? All that kind of interaction with anger. It says, Whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. And I can tell you, before husband and wife will take themselves to court, and before they will tell the court, separate us, there's been a lot of sessions of anger and wrath and indignation at home. Before a member of the church can come out openly and point fingers on the local pastor, I'll be shaking the finger like this. There's been a lot of anger in the private. And before two members can be discussing, we frown 
and with anger and with trembling voice against another member in the church or minister in the church before they can be doing that openly there's been a lot of anger in the private many people have forgotten we came to church as the gateway and the path to heaven they have forgotten heaven they are now like nominal churchgoers, nominal church commons. They are not thinking of heaven at all. They have forgotten the rapture. They have forgotten the day of redemption when the Lord will come for his sealed possession. Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Especially, you know. If you say it on the street, that's bad enough, that fool. If you say it in your office, you don't understand the character of true leaders. That's bad enough. When you come to the church and you're teaching on the pulpit and you utter words of anger on the pulpit, you have forgotten that the pulpit is the highest place you can be to speak for the Almighty God. The Lord deliver all of us in Jesus' name. But let's come back to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, clamor, that's uh, open, loud contention. Open, loud contention. You might be a young person, and you might be an elderly person. You just saw the person that owed you money, and we just finished the service. And somebody said, look at the person you spoke to me about. You've been looking for him. You couldn't get him. And then you rush there, you grab him by his uh, coat. You say, I get you today. I see you today. Today, today, you will not go until you pay me my money. You begin to shout. And the ushers come and say, keep it down. Lower your voice. Everybody is saying, I'll say, I want everybody to hear. This man is a debtor. And you're shouting and shouting and shouting. And then they are telling you, this is the house of God. Uh-huh, house of God. I see this person. I will not get my money. Leave me alone. Let's look at First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, clamoring, bullying, shouting, fighting. If any man seems to be contentious, argumentative, I will not take that. I will not have that. We must resolve it today. The pastor doesn't like people shouting in the church. Hey, take us to the pastor. I'm going to shout in his presence. They've lost all sense of the sacredness of the house of God. They've lost all sense of the sacredness of the ministers of God. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Neither the churches of God. First Timothy chapter 6. In First Timothy chapter 6, I read from verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to hold some words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives of words, whereof cometh envy and strife, railings and evil submissions, perverse disputings, arguments of men of corrupt minds, and destitute 
of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Tell me. Tell me out aloud. From such withdraw thyself. Whatever is position, whatever is authority, whatever is title, whatever is pride, whatever he says about himself, from such withdraw thyself. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Evil speaking. There are people who take liberty for license. And what we didn't know in the midst of the children of God years gone by, we see it so often now, we hear of it so often now, they have no respect for anybody. Leaders in the nation, leaders in the community, leaders in the church, pastors in the church, overseers in the church, they have no respect, no regard for anyone. And they speak evil. And they might even pass that evil into the hands of other people to speak evil openly of leaders in the church, in the presence of the whole church, it grieves the Holy Spirit. It makes us to look like people who are forgotten. We shouldn't strive against the priesthood. Jude chapter 1. In Jude chapter 1 verse 8, Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities speak evil of dignities yet Michael the archangel when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of Moses does not bring against him against the devil against Lucifer a railing accusation but said the Lord rebuke thee, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but that what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. One to them. They have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam for the word and perished in the gate seen of Cori, Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast themselves, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up, by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness. How long? Forever. That means then we as children of God should not keep any of these traits, any of these character traits, because they grieve the heavenly guide. They grieve the Lord. They displease our Father. And they dishonor the Savior. Grieving the heavenly guide, you miss his guidance. You miss his fellowship. You lose his favor. You lose his help and support. You miss his grace and gifts. You miss his freshness and fullness. You miss his refreshing and renewal. Persisting in grieving him, you will miss his presence here, his presence 
in eternity. You miss his partnership here, and you miss his partnership in the future. You miss his peace, his purity, his power. You'll miss holiness. You'll miss heaven at last. God help every one of us that will not grieve the Holy Spirit who has sealed us by whom, with whom, was sealed unto the day of redemption in Jesus' name. Coming to verse 32, point number three, retaining tenderness while no more grieving the Holy Ghost. Tenderness, peace, mercy, gentleness. That's what a child of God should be known ways. A person that has the weakness of the spirit, the freshness of the spirit, the abiding presence of the spirit. There should be tenderness in verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. He wants us to be kind, generous, gentle, tender. In Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 10. Romans chapter 12, I read from verse 10. The kind of life he wants us to have, the kind of disposition he wants us to have. In Romans chapter 12, Verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. I must ask you, as a Christian, do you have honor for anyone at all? Do you have honor for the sisters? Honor for the brothers? Honor for your parents. Honor for those who are older than you are. Honor for the members of the church. Do you have honor for the pastor of the church? We should be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. It tells us in Colossians chapter 3. Reading from verse 12, Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 12. In verse 12 it says, Put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, Long suffering. It says we should put this on, have this on, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, even so do ye. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. Reading there from verse 32, how we are not to grip the spirit, the kind of heart we ought to have, the kind of disposition we ought to have. It says, and be kind one to another, tender hearted. What's on the inside will come out in the public, in the open. If the heart is tender, your words will be tender. Your action will be tender. Your comments will be tender. Your interaction will be tender. First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I read from verse 7. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Reading from verse 7. But 
we were gentle among you. We pastors, we were gentle among you. We overseers, we were gentle among you. We laborers together with God. We were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherishes her children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, how our labor and travail, for we for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable to any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believed. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And all things of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, were to be bridges between the sinners and the Savior. And as a bridge, want to conduct the people to the Lord. You'll be tender, you'll be kind, you'll be gentle, you'll be merciful, you'll be loving. Verse 19, to wit, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, and not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we plead with you tenderly. We pray you, we plead with you tenderly and softly. We are pleading softly. In Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. He wants forgiveness in the house of God, but he doesn't want that forgiveness to become a license. That means he'll forgive me 70 times 7 times. I spoil everything in the house of God. Of course, they'll forgive me. I'll blaspheme. Of course, they'll forgive me. I will push everybody down. Of course, they'll forgive me. And they'll keep on forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. Not right. That's not true. You might become a Cora, a Dathan, an Abiram. Be careful. You might become an Achan. Be careful. You might become a Judas Iscariot. After warning and warning and warning, he'll forgive me. I do it again. I do it again. Be careful. You might perish in your sin. And when you perish in your sin, you go to hellfire forever and ever. Don't gamble with your salvation. Don't gamble with your eternal life. Don't gamble with heaven. God forgives. But you know, you might cut off yourself from life eternal by just taking God for granted. He'll forgive, he'll forgive. And then you commit the last one that doesn't have forgiveness. We're coming to First Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 8. 
First Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 8. It says, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one on an of another, love as brethren, be pitiful and be courteous, a real brother mistakenly offending and is forgiven, will not go and deliberately do that again and grieve the Holy Spirit and keep on offending and offending and offending. Be a brother, be a sister, be a son in the family, be a daughter in the family. As we are to have compassion on you, have compassion on us too. Have compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that they shall inherit a blessing. I pray you'll inherit a blessing. I said, I pray you'll inherit a blessing. In First John chapter 5, First John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and it shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. That is, when people sin, they fall, they backslide, but mercy is still waiting for them. The second death has not been clamped on them. But it tells us there are people that keep on sinning and sinning and sinning, like Judas Iscariot, and then they get to the point of no return, and the second death is clamped on them. Verse 16, there is a sin unto death. I do not say he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. When the Spirit of the Lord is still pleading, come back home, come back home, prodigal son, backslider, sinner, pray, repent, seek the face of the Lord. But when the Spirit keeps quiet and it will no more plead with you, that's terrible. And when you go on and on and you are hardened in sin, and the Spirit of God has been withdrawn. You have grieved Him. That is terrible. I pray none of us will get to that point. And then we can still pray and we look at our lives and the Spirit of God is still faithful and is still pointing out, you missed your step there. You missed your act there. You shouldn't have done that. And the Spirit is still pleading, repent. I will repent. I pray that mercy will come. Look at Acts chapter 26. What will lead others to repentance, forgiveness, and salvation. Acts chapter 26. I'm reading here from verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God and that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's why we're talking to them. 
pleading with them, preaching unto them, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Acts chapter 5, reading from Bastachi. Acts chapter 5, I'm reading from Bastachi. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. That to attend that doesn't mean we're not going to tell the people their sins. We'll tell them so they can repent. Him has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That's what we preach, so that the Lord will grant them forgiveness, the sinners. In Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Acts 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. He bore our punishment. He bore our pain. He bore our perdition. That's what we're preaching unto the people, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 14. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of of sins. We have redemption, present redemption, there's still a final redemption, and then we have the forgiveness of sin. First John chapter 1, verse 9. First John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. After forgiving us, he gives us the power to go and sin no more. First John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him. Those who continue and sinning and sinning, they'll forgive me. Sinning and sinning, God will forgive me. Sinning and sinning, the pastor has no choice. If he's going to obey the Bible, he must forgive me. Sinning and sinning, the leaders have no choice. They must forgive me. I'll keep on messing up my ministry. I'll keep on messing up the teaching. I'll keep on messing up the, the pulpit. I'll, I'll keep on messing up my opportunity. They must forgive. That's not a child of God. That's a backslider. He has fallen. If he's not careful, he can go beyond the point of redemption. Verse 6. Whoso abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Whoso he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, tell me, are you still there? Whosoever is born of God, tell me out aloud. 
does not commit sin. Look up here. There are people that have readjusted that and they say, whosoever is born of God does not make a practice of sin. What they imply by that is he cannot be free from sin although he is born of God, but he does not make a practice of it. He will sin. He will do evil. He will commit sin, but he does not make a practice of it. Those people don't realize their own deception. If somebody is a robber, and he went to the bank, and he broke up the bank, lied down, and then he took their money, and he was arrested. And then he gets before the judge, and say, Judge, I have a word to say. I don't make a practice of robbing the bank. Once in a while, I don't make it a practice. It's not my habit. But once in a while, when I need some money, I go there, I do what I just did now. Will the judge set him free because he doesn't make a practice of robbing? Tell me, no. I don't make a practice of sinning. I only do it once in a while when I'm not able to contain myself. God, the judge, will not set that sinner free. Habitual sinner, occasional sinner, deliberate sinner, careless sinner. A sinner is a sinner. Look at verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Praise God. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. First John chapter 5, verse 18. First John 5, 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinners not. That's you. I said that's you. He'll give you the grace. He'll give you the power. He'll give you the strength. You will resist the devil. He will not push his sin down your throat in Jesus' name. We know by experience. We know by the power of God. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one toucheth him not. What is he? What is she? The devil will not touch you. He will not force you to do evil. You will not blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You will not grieve the Holy Ghost. You will live a life that has kindness, has tenderness, has forgiveness, has love, has mercy, has peace. And you will be sharing peace and compassion in the body of Christ in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Really pray tonight. The word of God has been made very plain and very clear that you will not, you will not grieve the spirit. And every sin, every transgression that will grieve the spirit, you will confess and forsake. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will pardon you. Will wash you. Open your mouth and pray. Then you will have the character of the Christian, the comportment of the Christian, the kindness of the Christian, the charity of the Christian, the love of the Christian, the tenderness and gentleness of the Christian, the forgiving spirit of the Christian, having the peace of God and standing in the place 
where you have been totally forgiven, you stretch out the hand of love and mercy to other people so they too will receive the forgiveness of the Lord. Pray and the Lord is, let the Lord strengthen you that will be that Christian that lives without sinning.